Hello again everyone, welcome to episode 13 of the Cricket Her Social Isolation Vodcast. Um, I'm going to be presenting again this week, despite being a woman and therefore obviously supremely unqualified to discuss cricket on the airwaves. Yeah, I should should say at this point that uh, that dear old Jeffrey is a good good friend of <laughs> good friend of the site and a long time listener <laughs> to this podcast. So morning morning Jeffrey, <laughs> nothing personal. Um, Where are we this week, Sid? <laughs> moving swiftly on. Well, after last week being uh, last week, you'll remember we hijacked the Sky Pod and took it to Chelmsford. Um, this week we're at County Match between Middlesex and Warwickshire. But where are we? That's your question for this week. Cool. Get on with answering that. So, first bit of news this week, Sid. Heather Knight has been appointed um, as a vice chair of the Professional Cricketers Association. So that's an exciting bit of news. It's a kind of intriguing appointment in the sense of last week on the broadcast we discussed the fact that actually we have been made aware that the PCA are reviewing these new domestic contracts and obviously the domestic retainers as well. And the Heather Knight's appointment therefore is perhaps not a coincidence given that that process is happening at the moment. I guess that she'll um, be speaking on on that process. So what do you make of, of that appointment? It's an important one for women's cricket? Yeah, I think it is potentially a very interesting and important appointment. Um, it's easy to see the Heather Knight, the, the kind of public face of Heather Knight, who doesn't say very much and you know tries to you know, avoid controversy and things. And it's easy to separate that out from the, the kind of more private person. But in, in private and behind the scenes, she's actually uh, quite a forthright person. Um, she's someone that, that has a voice and you know wants to make it heard. Um, and I think possibly going a little bit far to describe her as a social justice warrior, but she does have a strong sense of you know justice and fairness and integrity. Um, and if anybody's appointed her to this committee, thinking that she's going to be more like her public persona of sort of a bit of a, a yes person, then they're going to get a bit of a rude awakening there. She will she will defend a corner, she will fight it, and she will you know fight it in the interests of what she believes to be the the wider context of the game, and you know and women in cricket. So potentially a, a very interesting impo- appointment over the longer term. Okay. I guess as, as England captain and someone who's very much come up through the, the county system at Berkshire particularly, she'll have that interest and she'll understand the needs of domestic players. Yeah, I think that she will. I, I, I don't think she's the kind of person that's going to forget her roots. So I think that, you know, that she'll make her voice heard. Okay. Another bit of news this week. Good news for the England women's team is that Amy Jones and Lauren Winfield have both flown back from Australia, ready to join their team on, I think it's the 22nd of June that they're resuming their training, so that will be next week. And also, interestingly, Lisa Kitely has also returned from Australia, despite the fact that she is an Australian citizen, so we thought that perhaps that might be a bit more of a complex process, but that this is all good news in terms of trying to get back to some normality for international women's cricket. Yeah, the Australian government have pretty, made it pretty clear that Australian citizens are only allowed to leave the country under fairly exceptional circumstances, so Lisa Kitely has obviously you know, persuaded the powers that be that, that these merit those circumstances, um, and it's good news for England, obviously, to have their coach back. They didn't want to be in a position where they had to start training and her to have to kind of manage the team from a distance. That, that could have been tricky. Wouldn't have been great. Um, and, you know, it's also good news in terms of the fact that it, it really shows that us that the ECB are getting on and are serious about, you know, pursuing uh, the England women and getting them, you know, back to the point where we can hopefully still play some internationals this year. Okay. And we haven't had any more information about how the return to training will look for England women. We talked, I think it was two or three weeks ago, about the fact that the men had returned at a very kind of gradual stage and they were they'd been sent to their local county grounds. Does it seem a bit more likely that the England women's team will be training all together in a bubble at Loughborough because we're we're in a slightly easier stage of, of lockdown now where that might be possible? I think obviously that's what what makes sense, and Lisa Kitely will be keen to get the whole squad together as soon as possible, you know, to try and prepare them for these 
these matches that they're that they're that they're working towards. The, the squad are there on the understanding that mm. they will be playing these matches. Um, obviously, there remain issues with with Loughborough because not everybody lives at Loughborough. So um, those that don't live in Loughborough traditionally live in accommodation on the university campus. Um, and I've no idea whether that accommodation is open. I would guess at the moment it isn't. Um, and so you know, solutions may still have to be found. Um, but you know, I think that they will be and you know, they'll make some progress there. Yeah, and at the moment the guidance from the UK government is still that people aren't permitted to stay overnight anywhere. They are permitted to travel, but they're not permitted to stay overnight. But I suppose in sporting terms they could gain an exemption from that. I think that the, the, the fact that the Loughborough Training Centre and the accommodation where the England team usually stay is on the university campus is actually quite interesting in itself. I mean, I work for a university and our campus is, is basically closed. We're not permitted to go there and we've been told in no uncertain terms that if we do try to get there, essentially it's illegal um, and we won't, be, we won't be allowed on. We won't be able to get into the buildings. And um, I would imagine that Loughborough University is, is much the same. I don't even know whether they will have the staff, you know, for example, when, whenever we go to Loughborough, there's a, there's a barrier for, to drive in and you can't actually get in unless there's somebody there operating that. Will they, do they even have that level of staff? Do they have the staff who are there to maintain the accommodation, for example, and things like that? You know, the, the cleaners and the, and, and the catering staff that you would need for that England women's training bubble to to get up and running at Loughborough. So these are all kind of challenges that um, th that present themselves, even if you do manage to get the whole squad back together, training all together again. Yeah. Okay, uh, another big conversation of the week, as far as um, women's cricket goes, was that there was another one of these ICC Webinars was held, hosted by Mel Jones in conversation with Sophie Devine and Jemima Rodriguez, and they talked about innovations that we could make to women's cricket to make it more interesting. We might dispute the very essence of that webinar because we find women's cricket quite interesting as it is. But two of the things that seemed to be on the table were shorter pitches and smaller balls for women's cricket. Now, Sid, you've expressed quite strong views about this in the past, haven't you? Is, is your view essentially remain the same? Yeah, I, I think that shorter pitches is a non-starter for all sorts of reasons, not least the fact that people start playing on club grounds and clubs are not going to start maintaining a second pitch for you know the small number of women's games that are, that are going on. Um, and I don't think that it's realistic to expect players to play on different size pitches. Um, a lot of women in the sort of middle to upper tier of the game also play men's cricket um, at you know league level, um, and you know asking them to asking bowlers to play one week on one size pitch and one week on another size pitch is really not going to help anybody. Um, and you have to ask yourself, however, you know what 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 problem is this actually solving here? What problem are you solving by doing this? You know there are plenty of innovations that we could take forward into into women's cricket, but you have to look at what. What problems they're solving? We've seen an interesting um, innovation proposed in the men's WBBL. I don't know whether this is going to apply to the women's WBBL as well, which essentially is going to clamp down on leg side wides by awarding a free hit for a leg side wide, um, with the purpose, obviously, of course, of effectively what they're doing is creating a baseball style strike zone um, and saying to the bowler, you must bowl, you know, in that strike zone, which makes it easier for the batter to 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 hit big shots, you know, and. In, 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 that's a reasonable innovation. I mean, you can you can argue against it, but it's got a clear purpose. It's saying we want we want more big shots, we want more big hitting, we want higher scores. Um, let's you know let's eliminate that that leg side stuff and let's force the bowlers to bowl everything in the strike zone. So you know th there's a, there's a reason for that. But the reason for shorter pitches, I'm not really quite sure what that is or what that would be. Um, as for a lighter ball, well, we've already got a bit of a lighter ball, and in fact, some players consider the lighter ball a problem and would rather play with a heavier ball because you can get more momentum on it. You can get more, you know, bounce off the mm. off the bat, more twang off the willow. So, <laughs> um, you know, I think that it, it, that certainly the, not not every player by all by all means would uh, would agree with that even. Yeah, I as I kind of hinted at already I really struggle with the very premise of that webinar of having a webinar where we say right what do we need to do what do we need to change about women's cricket to make it more interesting to make it more exciting and I just think it's fine as it is like what we need to do is value what we've got 
and work out, I guess, probably how we can market it better and how we can get more people along to matches and make it more interesting. But that doesn't involve fundamentally tweaking the game. It's it's a kind of similar line of thought um, to developing the 100 in a way. It's going, oh, well, we need to do something that's completely bonkers and just completely change cricket's very core foundation, i.e. overs. Uh, and actually, no, we just need to... Um, we just need to work more effectively with what we've already got, which is a really good product that you can get 86,000 people along to watch at the MCG. Why is that? Why is it that we've just had a record crowd at the last international women's cricket that's been played? And the thing that's now being talked about is how can we make women's cricket better by doing these silly things? Absolutely. Okay. I'm glad we're in agreement, Sid. Thanks. That's good. See, even after months of lockdown, um, we are still in harmony. And we did have a tweet, actually, because there was... <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> there was a bit of a debate sparked off on, on Twitter about this, um, and the, the shorter pitches particularly, after you retweeted your piece from several years ago. Um, and there were some quite interesting tweets going around. I'm just going to read one from Lauren Rolls, who's a women's county player. She said, last season, I played a county game at a ground without covers. The grass hadn't been cut and the changing rooms were a rusty shipping container. I think there's other factors that can help the development of the women's game. So I guess what she's saying is that at kind of more of a domestic and grassroots level, there's still fundamental issues with the actual pitches that they're playing on at the moment and the fact that um, priority isn't being given even to women's county matches for kind of the use of, of good wickets and that's yeah. really problematic. Yeah, so you know, solve the problems that we have, don't solve imaginary problems that we don't actually have. Yeah, exactly. It's a good summary. Well done, Sid. You should be a writer, you know. Nah, I'll be rubbish at it. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think we've made our views on that pretty clear. <laughs> Last... Big news story of the week, and this is kind of more of a wider international news story, is that apparently New Zealand have successfully eliminated coronavirus. They have no cases, which is really exciting. And obviously the next big women's cricket event is meant to be being held in New Zealand in early 2021, I think February. So that's really good news as far as our World Cup goes, Sid. Yeah, well, we saw pictures um this weekend from New Zealand of their uh, domestic rugby competition resuming in front of you know fairly packed stadium in New Zealand um, and you know people getting life back to normal and mm. I, I guess it shows what you can do with a half decent government um, <laughs> yeah we can do with one of those oh no we, no don't get political don't get political Jeffrey won't like it no, he won't sorry sorry Jeffrey <laughs> just just rewind that bit and then fast forward over it and then you won't have to hear it um, no, seriously, um, to get back to New Zealand, yeah, it's, I mean, it's great news for New Zealand. New Zealand have obviously, you know, the government there have worked hard and effectively to put themselves in a position where they can do that. Um, you know, and it's good news that they've got sport back on. I do think we have to be slightly careful, though, in the terms of it, it's much easier to get a domestic competition on and going um, because obviously all those people are operating within New Zealand. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a big difference between doing that and flying in um, seven teams from all over the world with their support staff and you know all the the media staff and the the cameramen and the umpires and the ground staff everything that will be needed to to manage the actual World Cup. So there's a difference between them, um, and there's, there still remains you know a risk of flying people in and you know them bringing coronavirus back mm. into New Zealand with them, which is the last thing the New Zealand government a bit want. Of a PR disaster if women's cricket causes a resurgence. Yeah. yeah. So it's no guarantee that um, that the World Cup will go ahead, but overall you know it's good news and well done New Zealand, gold star. <laughs> and we have your prime minister now. I, mean, yeah. I think you've had her long enough. It's our turn. Yeah. That would be good. Thanks, guys. Um, I guess that the... You can the, have ours. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're welcome happy to, to donate keep, keep him. him. <laughs> Forever. More bits for Jeffrey. He's great. Yeah. Forward through. Sorry, Jeffrey. Um, I guess that the, the kind of big issue that still doesn't seem to have been resolved is what happens if, as you say, you fly in all these teams for a World Cup and you spend all that money, you invest all that money in getting a tournament underway and then the night before the first game... Um, let's say everyone's on in, in one site um, because that would be the simplest way to do it and the night before the first game somebody in one of the teams tests positive for coronavirus 
what do you do? And actually that's still an unanswered question in even though we're seeing that the West Indies men's test series in England is going to be getting up and running in a couple of weeks' time, isn't it? But it still looks like the ECB have gone down the route of, well, if someone tests positive for coronavirus, we just get in a substitute. And that's the way it works. Yeah, I mean, obviously what's happened in this country is that the British government have given the Premier League football competition, you know, the the green light to kind of go ahead with that. And everyone else is kind of picked up and running with it because, you know, I guess the Premier League made the, the, the case coming down to economics that if they had to actually isolate the entire team for 14 days, if one person tested positive, that it would be an economic disaster and they'd have to cancel the league again. And as it is, they're, they're now very hopeful they are going to finish that and, you know, get their television fixtures and, you know, get the money in, which is what funds the whole circus at the end of the day. Um, in terms of the cricket, um, you know, yeah, if we, if we get the teams into New Zealand and then one member of a squad um, catches it, or it comes to, is tested positive rather, um, you know, on one level, of course, you can say, well, we'll isolate that person and we'll let them bring in a reserve. Um, but on a, on another level, of course, if one person inside a bubble has got the virus, it's a bubble. People are inside <laughs> it. Yeah. Mm, there's going to be other people with the virus. Absolutely. And the worry would be what happens if, you know, seven or eight of the Australian squad come down with it and they just can't play their matches. Brilliant. Somebody else will win the World Cup. It'll be good. Well... I would be, I suppose. <laughs> that's the, that's literally the only way that Australia aren't going to win, isn't it? Probably. I'll probably still win, actually. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we don't wish the virus on any member of any team. Um, we should make that clear. No, absolutely not. No. Um, yeah, no. So, it's, yeah, there are some logistical difficulties. But, yeah, as you say, congratulations to New Zealand. That is really positive news from our corner of the country, even though we are still, we are very envious of you. I think that's that's pretty much us done for this week. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the vodcast and um, see you in a week. Stay safe and well. Bye.